the presentation today regarding my experience at USC. And primarily, I want to take you through a number of different um, agenda items. One of them being, I'll tell you how, what my journey was or has been to this day, um, how I got into the USC program, um, what my batch profile was like, because obviously profiles differ individually a lot. So just my profile isn't a very good estimate of what you need to get into USC. Um, what was my experience while settling in, the culture at USC in Los Angeles specifically, my academic and post-academic experience, and then we'll have a quick Q&A. So I expect to divide this time into half and half. So we'll have like 30 minutes of me monologuing and then 30 minutes of you guys asking me questions, whatever they may be. Um, so overall, um, I graduated from IBA with a BBA in marketing, which makes me sort of an oddball in the data science field. Um, I started working at TRG Tech as a strategy analyst, which was primarily a um, project management position. By around six, seven months later, I was tired of my job because it was a lot of repetitive automated, repetitive um, reporting tasks for a lot of clients. So I started um, finding out ways to automate those tasks and that's when I took my first course online. And that was John Hopkins Data Science Toolbox, which is a very popular course. Um, fast forward six months, took a lot of online courses, shifted to a company called Affinity. You might have heard of it um, in artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of people ask me how that happened. Basically, Affinity is a TRG company. So I sort of had inner access and then the company saw that I'm, I'm okay in math and everything and they were like, you know what, maybe you'll be better at Affinity than you are at TRG, so they shifted me to AI. It was at that time that I applied for a Fulbright scholarship. Um, fast forward one year later, I went to USC to pursue a degree in business analytics. Um, business analytics is primarily a mix of data science for business. So the entire focus of my degree was not exactly on how the algorithms may be working in detail, but how do I use those algorithms, how do I use the existing um, information out there to uh, make a difference in the business world. So went to USC, came back one and a half year later, I had a 16 month program and I have been serving as a data scientist at the data science consultancy named Love for Data. I hope you've heard about us. And I'm also a faculty member at IBA. Um, but how I got into USC MSBA is actually more interesting. Um, so I had a pretty decent um, academic profile, I can say that much. Um, I had a 3.9 GPA, I had a 332 GRE, good references. Um, I got my study objective and personal statement checked by a lot of people, um, made sure that I got them right. Um, the biggest thing that is on this page that should concern you is your relevance. Um, in the sense that is your past academic experience relevant to the field that you are applying to? Um, mine was not and I learned this the hard way because I applied to USC in the data science field and I applied to four places that was Columbia, New York, Northwestern and University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, all of those uh, universities asked for at least one course in CS on my transcript. And because of that, I was a BBA in marketing. I did a lot of online courses, but those don't count. But because of the lack of a CS background, I actually did not get into um, the data science programs anywhere. Um, despite the fact that my GRE was probably above average for the class sizes and everything. So when you're applying to Fulbright, make sure that the field that you apply to is relevant. So if let's say you are a marketing major like me, and you want to apply for data science, I would recommend that you take the time and enroll in a course in your university in the CS background. Or go out and check what the prerequisites are for the universities that you wish to apply to so that you can take the prerequisite courses and at least meet that eligibility criteria because USCFP cannot do much about eligibility criteria. So those are set in stone. And they can help you get into a good university, but you have to meet the eligibility criteria yourself. Um, the other part of all of the Fulbright application process that often comes up, and I do have lengthy videos on it as well if you search for it, um, that's the study objective and the personal statement and the references. Um, what I can tell you um, over here is that in terms of references, there is a trend in Pakistan that teachers ask you to write the reference yourself and they just sign it. Um, 
regardless of whether that's right or wrong, what often happens is that A, either students go overboard in the sense that, you know, this person is the next Albert Einstein and it's that sort of stuff coming into a recommendation. Or it becomes very generic. Um, I've seen recommendations looking like um, he attended all of my classes and did the assignments on time and did the quizzes on time and got a good grade. Neither of those references actually make a very good impression, in my opinion, at least. When you're going for references, what you want to do, ideally, is come up with concrete examples, something along the lines of this student said something like this in my class, which makes me feel that he is going to be a good candidate for this field. That's the sort of um, transferable skill that you're looking for in your reference. Um, coming to the personal statement. Again, there are two basic flaws that I've seen in personal statements. Uh, one of them being that we tend to either not be able to write about ourselves at all, or we tend to elevate our achievements to a status which doesn't really suit the actual achievement itself. Um, what I mean is, I recently reviewed a personal statement starting something along the lines of, um, Ahmed, you are a genius, is what my parents have always told me. And when anybody looks at that personal statement, the impression that goes out with statements like this is either arrogance or that you think you're so good, why do you need admission into USCFP or into a full background or any university to begin with? And then again, you want to sort of um, ensure that you're modest while you're highlighting what you've done. And the message that needs to maybe come across is that, you know, I've done this much, I want to do more, um, help me do more. And the same thing more or less holds for the study objective as well. It has to be coherent, it has to link to your personal statement. I can take more relevant questions on this um, later, but let's get into the USC part itself. So. My batch at USC was an overall 75 students. Um, there were 50 Chinese students, around 12 Indians and 12 Americans. And then there was me, so only one Pakistani. Um, they had an average GRE score of 320, an average GMAT score of 726, an average undergrad GPA of 3.6. I think the bigger part of this is that almost half of my batch came without any work experience. And that's a big plus because um, usually people are always concerned about whether we need work experience to go into a business field or not. Specifically, MBAs usually require a lot of work experience. However, MS degrees usually do not require that much work experience. So even if you're applying as a fresh grad, you have a pretty decent chance. Um, what I can say is that even the first line, even though it may look a little demotivating, it's actually a good thing. It means that not many Pakistanis are either applying to USC or they're not getting in, and diversity is always a big factor for all of these universities. So if there are no Pakistanis and I come across as, I, I would assume that if they come across a CV from, let's say, the Chinese student or a Pakistani student, they're both almost the same, and they have all, already they have 50 Chinese students in the batch, they might actually give you a preferential treatment there. So that is there. Uh, that's the whole batch profile. Obviously, there are going to be cases which do not meet this benchmark. There are going to be cases which do meet this, meet this benchmark. I mean, if the average GRE score is 320, then you can imagine that maybe like 40-50% of people did not get a 320. So the averages can be a little scary that way, but we should look at um, that there are people who don't have this much score and they have a uh, But the biggest question that I ask and I ask even now as I begin to apply for my PhDs is that wherever I go, will I feel at home? And I've divided this into three or four distinct segments for you. Um, the first one is actually the one we think about most and it tends to be the easiest. And that is the one on the top left, the one in blue. Um, the food, the clothing, the housekeeping, um, religion, travel. Um, so I can tell you specifically about USC, none of this is an issue. Um, food, if you are a practicing Muslim, you do get halal food everywhere. Even within the university, outside the university, um, you can get halal meat everywhere. It's Los Angeles, it's a metropolitan. You will not run into those issues. Um, clothing, again, what I will say is that wait for your Thanksgiving sales. Clothing is actually pretty cheap in the US. Um, housekeeping is one which tends to come back and hit us a return. We need to learn how to settle into that because um, 
Pakistan in general relies a lot on housekeeping help and the culture in the US is completely different. So house help is extremely expensive and you end up having to wash your clothes, cook your own dinner, do everything yourself. Um, I think that's the biggest part of the learning experience in the US because for us, it lets us understand what matters to us more and what matters to us less. It really puts things in perspective. Um, traveling here and there, by travel, what I mean is travel within the city. Again, um, LA does not have the best um, public transport infrastructure, but if you are going through USP, given that it's a USCFP, if given that it's a USCFP meeting, I'm assuming you're probably going through Fulbright, and in that case, um, you have your budget, you can travel, you usually get a pretty decent stipend. And in terms of religion, I think that this was the biggest factor for me. And uh, that is um, that I am a traditional Muslim and I found a mosque right outside my university. And that is actually the case um, in all major metropolitan cities at least. So I was looking at U Chicago. U Chicago has four mosques within walking distance. So all of that you actually feel at home. I'm getting some Q and A's. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I have only like eight or nine slides. Let me finish this, then I'll address your Q and A's, and then I'll open it up for further questions. Um, so the will I feel at home part? Um, top left, spot on, no issues. Bottom left, again, as a Fulbrighter, I used to get medical insurance. Universities do give medical insurance. I think the biggest thing comes into dental expenses and self care. Um, dental is extremely expensive and usually not covered by too many um, insurance policies and at least it's not covered to a very large extent. Um, so there's some co-pay involved. So when I was in the US, I had some dental issues. I ended up not eating anything sweet for a year and a half. And that's how I ensured that, you know, I will not get a dental expense. So that's a major hit. Um, but other medical expenses, usually you're good to go. Um, Self-care becomes important. Um, what happens is that over here, because we, we usually tend to live in joint family systems as Pakistanis, um, we are not used to self-care. We are used to saying that, you know, if I fall ill, somebody will take care of me. When you're living alone as a graduate student, that's not the case. So you need to know that, you know, if I fall ill, I need to get up and make some soup for myself so that I can have it and feel better. And that is part of the learning that comes in. That is part of the growth that comes in. Um, I also put in a section on urgencies and urgent travels and everything. And I can relate to this because I went to the US and I lost my mother around a couple of months later. And my forms hadn't come in yet and I wasn't really done with all my documentation. And I had to travel back urgently. And I can tell you that US EFP, extremely supportive. They actually mailed me all of my documents into Pakistan, even though I was supposed to get them in the US. Um, my university, USC specifically, extremely helpful. Um, I did not have to worry about missing classes. I did not have to worry about joining classes immediately when I got back. There was complete support. There was also student support. And I don't know if I can say that for all universities. I hope I can, but I won't make a general statement. But because it's LA, because you have students coming in from a lot of different cultures, the overall environment is very positive. So if something like this happens, you will see that a lot of students will step up to help you out. And I think that that was one of the best things about LA and about USC that I was never absolutely alone in the sense that that university, the people there, they're all amazing. One thing I was very concerned with, and that's why I put it here, was Indian students and Indian teachers. Um, the reason being, I, I do not bear any ill will to them, but I do not know if that same feeling um, reverberates, reverberates from that side. You know, so I do not know whether they are coming in with any grudges against Pakistanis. I am glad to tell you they're not. So when you are in Los Angeles, when you're in the US, Indians and Pakistanis stop being Indians and Pakistanis and we're just one big community from Asia, from South Asia specifically. And in that sense, the diversity is amazing. I can tell you that I had 12 Indians in my class. 11 of them I was amazing friends with. One of them I had some issues with, I won't lie. 11 of them I was great friends with. All 11 of them respected me and my religion and my beliefs to the extent that while I was around them, they would not drink because they knew that I would not partake in it. Also, they actually started their parties and kept a longer time. And they said, you know, Hassan will come, he will join in, he will have dinner with us, and then we'll do all of this. So everybody takes care of everybody there. And obviously we return the favor. So I tried not to eat non-veg in front of my Indian friends. So 
and there is this really amazing feeling regarding all of us coming together as one community if you're specifically going to USC. And I think that was one of the best parts of my experience at USC. Um, overall, USC and LA culture life, it was surprising. Um, I expected a very hustling and bustling metropolitan. It's not like that specifically. I found LA to be very relaxed um, to the extent that um, when I went to New York, I felt like I was back in Karachi because I, there were too many horns honking and there was too much um, dirt on the road and everything. So in LA, you can take your time at the cashier. You can take your time at the airport. The person behind you is not going to be like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Everybody is extremely relaxed, very friendly, respectful of all your religious and cultural differences. I think the only part that remains in terms of culture beyond that is that there's a plethora of things to do at LA. Um, you have museums, you have you have a museum right outside USC, the Natural History Museum. And uh, it's amazing, especially if you're into dinosaurs and all of that, you have actual fossils. Um, you're looking at um, a lot of art museums, you're looking at Holocaust museums, you're looking at multiple beaches. I mean, there's just so much to do in LA. Um, on that note, a lot of things in LA are expensive to do. So, for example, eating out is expensive. Um, traveling too far, let's say if you want to go to a beach and you're living in near USC and you want to go to Santa Monica, you're looking at a pretty decent um, expense in terms of Uber as well. LA in general is expensive. As a Fulbrighter, your stipend is adjusted to those expenses so you don't feel that much. Um, but if you're going without a scholarship, then you might need to cut down on your extracurricular activities in that sense. Um, in terms of my academic experience, um, I can say that the course rigor is actually fairly decent and that's because most MS programs in the US, I assume, are built around the assumption that you will be working a full-time job while pursuing your master's degree. So, all of the curriculum is built that way and you don't end up having to spend 40 hours or 60 hours a week on extra studies. The teachers ensure that whatever you're covering in class is enough and the assignments are a little bit more technical so that you cover extra ground. But uh, beyond that, um, that's about it. Um, you have a decent course variety. Um, so there's a 50-50 balance. In terms of an MS business analytics program, I had courses on strategy and I had courses in data science and I had courses in analytics. And I was also allowed to take courses from any other department if I wanted to. Um, I also got pretty decent research opportunities. I did a research with my professor in the summer vacations. Um, you can make contacts that way. So if you're sitting in class and you tell your professor, you know what, um, I'm a full writer, so I really don't need money. I'm getting my stipend. Um, what I need is really good experience. And if you have a research project, please let me know. Um, you'll get an opportunity probably 50-60% of the times. Um, and in terms of professional growth as well. So there were multiple internships that I got. I got a chance to be in a student association. Um, we can discuss that in the q and I think the next one is my last slide and then I'll come back to all of your questions. Um, in terms of my post-academic experience, all I can say is, did I get trade for a job? Um, pretty much, yes. I've had a decent job. For the last two and a half years, I entered a startup. Um, I knew enough to lead a team. I knew enough to lead um, data science projects. I knew enough to get clients on board. I knew how to converse with people. Thanks to the MS business analytics program, I knew how to communicate with people. I knew how to write proposals. I knew, I knew how to interact with clients. Um, I have been part of faculty. So did I learn enough to teach? Did I learn enough? to know how to answer questions that come my way. Um, I have had pretty decent um, faculty evaluations, so I guess, but I, I mean, you could um, reach out to one of my students and he may give you more candid feedback. But other than that, I think so. Um, I recently started looking into PhD opportunities. So I reached out to all of my teachers in USC, all of them replied almost within a day, and they have been super helpful. Um,